A group of us just got back uh, on uh, Friday night uh, from a week away in Tennessee. We were down there for a conference, uh, a gathering, an interdenominational gathering um, that uh, is a group of people, of ministers and churches that are just seeking uh, an awakening by God across the churches and, you know, just to stir up the fire of God. And it was an incredible time uh, of worship. It was in this big auditorium. 3,000 people were there uh, in, a, in one of the big churches down there. And the teaching was incredible. It's not just kind of like you go and you hear these fantastic speakers. These are people that are out on the front lines of ministry uh, maybe for years. And they're going, they're, it, you know, the attitude they come back is, is like, hey, this is what we're learning on the field, and we're trying to resource you. We've, you know, we, we want to get this thing moving forward and uh, calling us back to God. And it's just kind of incredible to, be, incredible to be in a room full of people that have dedicated themselves to uh, a life of service with God. There is worship like nothing else in that type of room. It doesn't matter what they're doing on stage. It's just the heart of the people come through. The last I've ever experienced that is like at seminary, because once again, you get Yet young people going, hey, we're dedicating our life. And so just a powerful experience and lots of great retooling and um, um, just spectacular. And then we got the privilege. We got the privilege to come home to you. It's our privilege to come home to you because... In this time, in this space, in this place, we spend our lives together. You are the body of Christ. You are his beloved, and we partner with you. And it is our joy and our delight, our privilege to work alongside of you. So we'll be unpacking more of kind of what, what that experience was and, and things that we've been retooled with. But we've been working on a series called Being Rich, uh, and so we've talked about this whole concept of being rich and, you know, how we kind of push it off. We're like, no, no, we're not rich. You know, we're, we're poor, maybe Midland, maybe we're, we're in the rich, but rich is someone else. Some, rich is somewhere else, no matter how far along I go, no matter how much I may advance, rich is always somewhere else, so it's not about me. It, uh, but as we've looked at that teaching, Paul is kind of pulling us back to this place of going, no, no. <laughs> Uh, those rich in this world are those that have enough, and we have enough. You know, there might be some people that are struggling in this area, but a lot of us, we have more than enough. We are rich in this world in a large sense. And so he goes, look, that's not the problem. It's not that having stuff is the problem. It's how you relate to your money. It's how you relate to your stuff. You've got to protect yourself. You've got to follow in the way of Christ as you build that relationship. So today, uh, we're not going to be talking so much about being rich as getting rich, because that's what we all really, really want. We want to get rich. Can I get an amen? No. So I have a great lead for you on this. This is hot off the press. You might want to pick up your pens. There are three perfect stocks. This just came across my computer. Three perfect stocks for retirees that can turn 300,000 into 1 million by 2030. Now, who wouldn't want to click on that? I mean, to triple your money is pretty good. Everybody would be in on that. I'm all in on that. I'm okay with this, right? But let's make some observations here about this clickbait here. Uh, so the first thing we would notice is uh, the gentleman himself, um, and, you know, with all due respect, uh, we would never mistake him for a college student, right? We're, we're not going to mistake him for a young family guy, right? He's, he's a retiree. He's down the road here some, uh, and uh, because he's probably the only one that has kind of 300,000. No college students sitting there with 300,000, right? So this is, this is for those that are down the road. You, you got some coin. You got some stuff in the bank. Hey, how do I triple that out here in, in a few a little while? So uh, you, you know, you're calling on that. And then you're going to more than triple it, uh, which everyone would buy, buy into. But then I noted, you know, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. By 2030. That's, that's what, 
Eight years away? We'll go with eight. We're going to do whole numbers here. Uh, eight years away, and I just kind of honestly got to go, is he still going to be around? You know, all due respect here, I'm sure he's planning on it, and we're living longer. We've got better health coverage, sort of, you know, better health systems and so forth, like, right? You know, we, 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 we're living longer. Uh, but I got to say, you know, when you get a certain stage of life, eight years, you're starting to roll the dice. Things happen. Things happen. I'm meaning no disrespect here, but you start to go, hey, yo, know, is a disease going to crop up? Is my ticker going to go bad? Am I going to have an accident? Am, is my body going to break down? I might be alive, but I might be in a wheelchair, right? Like a lot can happen in eight years really quick. Imagine that, 300000 to a million bucks in eight years, and they're putting you into a box. Does this mean a thing then? It looks really good. Everybody would buy into it. There's no problem with it. But there's just kind of this kind of, hmm, I don't know. It makes me think of a story, a really old story that Jesus told. He said there was this rich guy. He was rich and wealthy. He had a farm. Things were going very well. He had some buildings. He had some excess. Well, he did his farming thing, and one year he got a bumper crop, like just overflowing, double, triple, tripled his money, right? And he's like, wow, I don't know what I'm going to do. So he said, I'm going to tear down the barns that I have. I'm going to build even bigger barns so I can store all the excess that I have. And then I'm going to tell myself, kick back, eat, drink, be merry, stream Netflix. It's good. You're, you're set. You've tripled your money. You're sitting on a pile of cash. Who wouldn't want that, right? And then Jesus said... In this story, God said to the man, you fool, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Life is tricky and uncertain. And even if we could pull off that clickbait scheme and triple our money, there's no guarantees. Even Jesus points this out of going, don't be a fool. Don't mistake. Don't mistake what's of value here. And so he concludes his story with kind of a story Stupid, easy thing. So this must have been like a Bible theology 101. He was like, all right, I'm going to give you the answer so you know to write this down here. And he ends this state with a statement. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves and is not rich towards God. What we have here is Jesus doesn't criticize the guy for being rich. In fact, as kind of part of the story, I mean, the ground brings up all this excess. God is kind of lingering in the background of this, of going, God is the one that blessed this man. Uh, it's not that he has a lot of stuff that's wrong. Um, it's not a problem that he's rich. It's how he relates to the blessings that he has. And he puts this cl clue on of going, look, how he saw it was he saw it only for himself. He gave no recognition that this was God. He was arrogant. Well, look at what I've done. Gave no recognition. He didn't go, wow, like I already had access. Now I have even more. Imagine who I could share this with. No, no. This is all for him. It is only for me. And this is what this guy gets wrong. He was rich, but he was not rich Towards God. So the story has lots of layers to it. We're not getting into all of it, but it shows us one 
important contrast. It says, there is a rich that doesn't matter. Your bank account, your stock portfolio, it cannot add a day to your life. It cannot solve the problems of your life. There's a rich that doesn't matter. But it also says there is a rich that does matter, right? He goes, this man should have been rich towards God. It all kind of centers in on this, how do I relate to what I have? How do I see it? How do I handle it? That's what we've been talking about for these last couple of weeks. That's what Paul has been instructing Luke to, to, to tell those that are rich in this world. Let's look at it. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money. It's so unreliable. Our trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. He provides for us so we can provide for our family, so we can enjoy life. God's behind that. There are blessings. But let them know. Tell them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. We've unpacked all this, but I wrote, wrote, read it. We wrote, read it again because, you know what, our wallets are kind of thick and they're stubborn and the truth doesn't quite penetrate. Your, your purses get a little thick. We got to say it over and over again, right? These have been the things that we've been talking about. And he find, and Paul wraps up this teaching with one last statement. You know, he's going, okay, teach them to be this way, teach them to do these things. And then he says, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation, something solid, something that's going to last for the coming age. The way that we are invited to relate to what we have is more than just about the here and now. It is we are looking forward to something else. It is paving a way out ahead of us. We see it from a much larger point of view than just going, hey, it's here. And if we do that, then we can take hold of the life that is truly life. See, there are a lot of rich people in America. In fact, just about everybody in America is rich. Us too. And we can spend our money and our resources on satisfying ourselves, on toys and games and entertainment and chasing things. These things are not bad. But if we see these things of going, man, that's what's given me true life right now. It's a lie. It's a lie. And at some point, you run into it. Because there isn't enough money in the world to fix the problems that we have. We wrestle with this. You know, we, you know, we, we, we've kind of gone through this. We kind of go, hmm, yeah, uh, yep, yep, that's the way that I want to be. And yet, guess what? We've got garages, folks. Do you have a garage? Does your garage look like this? That's not my garage, but it might as well be. It's a two-car garage, which is a really interesting name because I think two cars have been in it only like once since I've owned it. I, well, that was like the first day that we bought the house. We put it in ever since then. Can't fit two. I've gotten one in there. Right now I can't. It looks like this, right? And we laugh about it. But this just screams, you don't know how to relate to your stuff. I, I, and so all this last winter, two vehicles outside of a two-car garage, every day that it snowed, cleaning it off and then shoveling around it, icing, putting, going out and putting tarps on it so it doesn't ice too bad and having the wind blow it. And, and I'm, I'm going... I wonder if the neighbors are watching me and going, what's wrong with that boy? <laughs> We're like aliens from outer space that are sociological. They're not worried about taking over. And they're just like, hey, we want to figure out the human race. And they seem 
watching me do this, like, is this guy mentally ill? Like, this is insane. He's got junk in there, and he's inviting all of this curse and aggravation into his life because he doesn't know how to relate to his stuff. Now, maybe your garage doesn't look like this. Maybe it's organized. Maybe, maybe even your finances are well organized. You've got it locked right in. But how far would we have to dig before we find that place where that relationship suddenly becomes a paramount to you? Oh, I've got it in order. I'm on top of everything because you know what? I really do like my money. In fact, I trust my money. That's why I stay on top of it, because if I stay on top of it, it'll take care of me. I take care of it, it takes care of me, and I can trust it. And I like that security it brings into my life. Paul says, no, watch out, it's a lie. At this conference, we, uh, we had a gathering of free Methodist uh, pastors and the churches that were there, and we welcomed some new churches into the Free Methodist Church from the United Methodist Church as they're kind of going through a bit of their divorce, and we were welcoming them. Uh, the bishop was there, and he, so he ended our time with uh, going, hey, what's, what's going on? What's, what, what fires is God, are, is God sparking in the churches? And people were like, oh, man, this is going on, this is going on. And then this Asian lady stood up. She was from Washington State, and she said, well, it's not happening at my church. It's happening at my work. Like, God's just using me to speak into people's lives. She works at Boeing. And she goes, I work in a place of really smart people making a lot of money. And their lives are blowing apart. And they're hungry for something else. There isn't enough money to fix what's wrong with there's not enough money to get our kids off of drugs. It's not enough money to make our marriages work right. We're always going to be fighting about that. There's not enough money to stop the suicides. There's not enough money to stop cancer and accidents from happening. It's a lie. If you just had a little bit more of me, it'd be oh so good for you. How do, we, how do we fix this disease that we have? We can read these truths, but how do, how, do we, how do we change? God has some medicine for us. It's a really old prescription. This is one piece of it, but it's deep medicine. It's called tithing. If you've been in church, you've heard of this. Tithing is a an agreement that he set up with the nation of Israel way back at the beginning when he said, hey, look, you're going to be my people, and this is how we're going to relate to one another. They build it into the Constitution. Don't think IRS. That's not what this is. It's not a tax. It's not a spiritual tax. He said, actually, this is, this is an expression of our relationship between us because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to provide for you because you're my people. I'm your God. I, I'm giving you stuff. But to help you relate to your stuff rightly, I need to apply some medicine. You need to honor me with 10% back. We kind of go, gulp, 10%. Yes, 10%. In fact, this teaching is profound and deep and it's, it's talked about in lots of ways. It's summarized in Proverbs 3 this way. Honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruits of all your crops. He's going, the issue is I don't need your money, but I need your hearts, and your hearts get tied up with your wallets. And so this is going to be the medicine that helps you to remember I'm the one that is providing for you. So there's two important aspects of this, of going, it, it, you see that word first fruits. These folks were subsistence farmers. Like, they're not CEOs, they're not Wall Street, they're not bankers. These are mostly farmers. 
And so when you have your harvest, you kind of store things up and you're trying to keep enough food to make it through the year until the next harvest. Uh, we actually talked about this at the, at the uh, uh, seminar down there. And one guy calculated out of going, he estimates that they probably had about 60 days of lean meals. Like, we got one bean, let's slice it up for the family type of a thing. Like, it got tight. And understand, your food is starting to run out in the spring when you've got to work your hardest, starting to prepare the land and getting things going. That's when food's running out. Uh, and things are getting tight, and then finally your first fruits, your first crop comes in, and you're getting hungry, and God says, I want that part. That's rather audacious. It's not just, I want 10%. He goes, I want the part that matters the most when you're hungry. This is his agreement with them. He says, this is going to be medicine for you so that you remember who I am. There's another layer to this that I just learned at, at the seminar as we talked about it, something that I didn't know. So I'm going to get a refund on some of my uh, seminary training. Come on, these are the folks' jokes. Keep up. He said, w one thing that we don't appreciate about this if we're, not, if we're not farmers, if we're not agriculturalists, is that when you have a, a, a crop or you have animals, the ones that are the first, the ones that grow up the fastest, are ready to be reaped the first are biologically superior they're stronger they're healthier they produce more and so for a crop that's the one that you you pull off and you collect those seeds that's your seeds for for the next time a heifer the one that grows up the, fa the fastest big strong you don't slaughter that one or right you know you don't eat that cow you, you're, you're going to use him to sire other ones because he's biologically superior. And God goes, I want those ones. I don't want just the first, I want the very best. And the speaker that was teaching us this, he said, honestly, you look at this and it almost looked like, like agricultural suicide. This is not the way to run farms. But that was the point God was making with them. He said, I am your source, not your biology, not your cleverness, not your schemes. I am your source. And I want this so that I force you into a place where all you can recognize is who I am in your life rather than the coin in your pocket. It's the medicine you need. We gulp at thinking, oh man, I'm supposed to give 10% to God. How about these folks? They're slicing up beans going, <laughs> sorry kids, the first stuff's got to go to God. We're going to go a little more hungry. But God's going to provide. He's going to bless. Not, not the fields. It never was about the fields. And so it pushes us down this road of going, yes, yes, we want we want to recognize God. Now, this has been, this has been a, a, a teaching that has been perverted and twisted and changed that is not true. A lot of people will teach this of going, this is a deal that God makes that if you give God your tenth, then he's obligated to bless you. That is junk. That is not true. That is not what the Bible teaches. God is not obligated to anyone for anything you are not helping him out. As one article I read, tithing is not generosity. Paul was talking about generosity. If you're rich, hey, I'm gonna share with who I have. This is not, I've got something that God needs. God gave it to me. This is a practice of me honoring God being the provider in my life. It has nothing to do with generosity. And he gives it out the front. He stands, he goes, I'm a generous God. I'm already giving blessing. You've got it. This is who I am. I'm not waiting for you to get it right. We're not cutting a deal like we're equal partners. If you do your part, I'll do my part. I'm already doing it. Jesus taught this, right? He said, God blesses the, the good and the bad. He gives rain. He gives sunlight. He produces crops for everybody. He's already blessing. We are the ones that need this gift of tithing to fix our broken hearts that want to love the wrong thing. 
and trust the wrong thing. It forces us to go, God's my source. That was always the point of this. It's not about tax or it's not about the church budget. It's not about any of those things. This is about going, I want you to stand on my blessing and being able to relate to your stuff right. And this is the medicine you need. Jesus teaches the exact same thing. In Matthew 6, he goes, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What will we wear? All the pagans, all the people that think their life is on, on them, God's not looking out for them. They run around crazy. How am I going to pay these bills? Oh my goodness, I'm not going to make ends meet. I'm so poor, I can't figure out what's going to happen. What if they come and take my car? And they're They're crazy. That's what people that don't have God watching out for them, that's how they see their life. Ah, uh, but you, don't you worry. Chill. Your heavenly father knows that you need these things. He's generous. He's got you. Calm down. It's okay. What you need to do is you need to seek first. Did you notice the language? That's tithing language. This is tithing theology. You need to order your life right of going, God is first. He's the provider. I don't, I don't need to grasp and worry and complain and chase I need to manage what God gives me appropriately. But my father knows what I need. And if I put him first and his righteousness, guess what? All these other things are going to be provided. He's just teaching the gift of tithing. That's it. He says, this is what fixes your heart. This is what moves you out of that craziness thinking your money is going to solve you. You know what our money does to us? It brings down curses upon us. Just like our stuff does. Everything sitting in my garage I thought was the cat's meow and was going to be something great. And it's, it's a millstone around my neck. It makes me stand out in the wintertime cleaning off a car that should never have to be cleaned off. My wife to get up early in the morning, clean off her car before she goes to work because I got my stinking stuff that I thought was going to be so great. Yeah, it's all lies. What I need to do is seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. All these things, all the rest is going to come into order. So see, Tithing is not about a duty. Tithing isn't about some type of spiritual IRS code. Tithing is an invitation. An invitation into going, you've got my blessing. Do you know how to stand and stay in that place? Do you know how to relate well to what I want to give you? And when we do, when we step into that, Tithing goes way, forget duty. We get the opportunity. When, it, when, when we grow up into this, it becomes a declaration. Mm, my money's not got me. God's got me. My money isn't just for me. It's for bigger things. I want to support what God is doing. That's what the tithe did in part back then. Supported the work of God. That's what it does now. But please understand, this isn't about the, the church budget. You don't give to the church. Tithing is about your spiritual relationship to God. And then God takes care of the church through that. This is about you going, God's got me. And it doesn't matter. I, look, look what he's provided that I can get to give out of this. Look at what he's given me that I can support the work of the church. 
Because you know what? I believe in the work of the church, that there is something incredibly important. I don't want to live in a world where the mission of God evaporates. What we don't need is another sports team. What we don't need is another AP class. Not against either one of those. Those are great things. But if we go, boy, if we can just get enough AP courses, they could work at Boeing and make a lot of money and have their lives blow apart. The mission of the church is to remind our people that there is a spiritual center, a soul that we are created for God that money can never fill. And so we unite our money together to go, man, we are on mission in this community. We don't want more kids just kind of going off thinking, well, I live for myself, I make money for myself, and one day I get put in a box and it's all over. How horrible. There's a father who knows you, knows what you need. I can stand in that with confidence. And it doesn't matter what my bank account says, I'm taken care of. Because God's first, he's provided. Didn't we, didn't we just talk about this, names of God? He's El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. He's Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. He's out ahead of you. We got this. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. As we would go through this, it says it will bring healing to your body and your soul and help you to stand in the blessing of God. We're going to celebrate communion today. And you might go, well, that's a switch. Talking about money and now we're going to go do communion. Not really. You know what Paul says? I'm going to go through a couple of these. You know what he wrote to Corinthians? For you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich, really rich. He owned it all. He ruled the universe. Yet for our sake, he became poor so that by his poverty, That rich has nothing to do with your bank account. It's stuff in your garage. It reveals the lies it tells and gives us the real thing of going, man, whether I am in plenty or in want, man, I have the blessing of God. I belong to his family. My destiny is secure. My purpose is clear. I am all that I need. This is exactly about the blessings of God. So let's hear the story. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. Always thanks for what God provides. And then he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is to be broken for you. You're afraid to be broke, but I have been broken for you. You worry about what you don't have, but you have all of me. I gave everything. Paul writes, if, if the father has not even withheld his only son, what else would he hold back? The generosity of God overflows to us. I give you all of myself. I am broken for you, even when you didn't care about me. When you followed the wrong way, I was broken for you so that you might be made whole. Take and eat. And after the meal, he took the cup and he gave thanks for it. Always, always thanks for what God provides. He said, this is my blood. This is my life. I freely lay it down for you so that you will forever be mine. No one takes you from me. No one. done this so that I could win you. You are my beloved. You are my cherished one. I'm all in on you. I don't hold anything back. You get me. You are rich. So satisfy your soul. We have
have cups here at the tables. I'm going to invite you to come forward. But uh, as you come forward, I want you to come with a confession. Let, let your walking and your coming and your taking be a confession of going, I don't want to trust my money. Heal my heart. I want to put my trust in you and you alone. I want to be rich in God and never look back. Never again be defined by what's in my bank account, what I have in my pocket, what I have in my garage. But God has given me all of himself. And I am his son and his daughter. And he welcomes me to his table. Let that be your confession as you come and take. And once you have your elements, you can just go ahead and proceed taking the, uh, the bread and